This is our missions month. We, for the last, this is the third week, next week will be the fourth week, and we've gone through for four weeks talking about the mission of the church and what we've been called to do as a church and how you and I and IES as a church fit in with the overall global theme of the church and mission of the church. And we've talked about a lot of different things that relate to that. But I've got a little bit of a dilemma as well because it's also Ladies' Day. You know, it's also Ladies' Day, and we always honor and pray for all the ladies of, of IES on this particular day. And so I've been thinking for about the last uh, months or so as I've been looking at my calendar, how am I going to do missions and ladies on the same day? And so I decided not to. No, I'm just kidding. And, and so there have been some things going on in my head, and there have been some things going on in my heart, and I've been working and looking at a bunch of different scriptures, and I had some things I wanted to say, and I've kind of revisited and revived that along the way, and I want us to take a look at, on a ladies' day, I want us to take a look on a perspective of how women are involved in the mission of the church, and what God wants women to be involved in the mission of the church, and, and the role that they play. Now, for in order for us to be able to do that, let's make sure that we're all on the same page here. What is the mission of the church? What is the church all about? Why do we exist? Do we exist to be able to sit in cool buildings with high ceilings and nice air conditioning and be able to listen to somebody talk? Do we exist in order to have great times together and, and get to know people who have the same interests in us and all of those different kinds of things? Do we even exist in order to help one another out and encourage one another and pray for one another in, in, in most discouraging times? No. Those things are all true and those things are all good, but that's not the mission of the church. That's the life of the church. The mission of the church is to share the good news about Jesus Christ to everyone all over the world. Once again, we remind ourselves of what it says in Matthew chapter 28, one of the last things that Jesus told his disciples. He said, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and I am with you always to the very end of the age. A promise as we fulfilled what he encountered or what he challenged us to do, that he would in fact remain with us and be with us. So we talk about this, and we talk about this commandment that you and I have to proclaim to everyone the good news, the gospel, that Jesus that has been restored, uh, God has restored us to him through the victory that Jesus Christ had on the cross, the victory over sin and the victory over the grave. And we're not only to proclaim that, but we're to bring those people in and be disciples. We call this the gospel, the good news. And for us, it's a word that's primarily related into its religion use, but when the early church opted this word and began to use this word, it was not primarily a religious word. It was, in fact, a way in which the message of a victory was won. So when an, when an emperor or when a great general would go off and, and fight a war, when he would defeat his enemies there would be a gospel, a good news proclamation. General so-and-so has defeated this enemy. Emperor so-and-so has defeated this enemy. And it would be proclaimed to everybody and it would be shared by everybody and everybody who heard the good news would spread the good news. It's pretty clear if you understand where it comes from that that's exactly that we're supposed to be proclaiming. That when Jesus Christ died on the cross, when God raised him from the dead, a great victory, uh, the ultimate victory was won over sin and over death, over the grave. And a promise of eternal life was given to us all. That's the mission of the church, to hear the good news and to spread the good news. Now, what does that have to do with this particular day? This is what we're going to spend a little bit of time wanting to do today. So everybody, please stand to your feet. And we're going to read a passage of Scripture together. I think I can safely say that you have never heard a sermon preached on this particular passage of Scripture. We're going to be reading together from Romans chapter 16, a letter that Paul wrote to the church in Rome. He wrote it to the Romans because he was preparing to go there in a little while. And there's a couple of things I need to tell you. Number one, uh, they, we're going to mention a lot of names. And, and, and don't be shy about saying the names because I really have no idea how they're supposed to be pronounced either. 
And so nobody around you knows any better than you do. You can just say it out as loudly as you want, and nobody can correct you. If you say it with enthusiasm and authority, people will think, wow, he really knows his Bible. He knows how to pronounce those names, and, and, and you'll look pretty good. And we're going to read this together. Now, this is what the, Paul wrote at the end of his letter as he's sending this letter with somebody to Rome so he can prepare them for the time when he's going to come. He's not been to Rome before, and he's not visited their churches before. Okay, everybody ready? You're all enthusiastic. You're all thinking, man, I love history. I just love it when Pastor Dave does history. Well, uh, the rest of you just be patient with me. Okay, we're going to do this together. Let's read, and let's read with enthusiasm, starting off in, in verse 1. I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a deacon of the church in Chinchere. I ask you to receive her in the Lord in a way worthy of his people and to give her any help she may need from you, for she has been a benefactor of many people, including me. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my co-workers in Christ Jesus. They risked their lives for me. Not only I, but all the churches of the Gentiles are grateful to them. Greet also the church that meets in their house. Greet my dear friend Epiphanitis, who was the first convert to Christ in the province of Asia. Greet Mary, who worked very hard for you. Greet Andronicus and Junia, my fellow Jews who have been in prison with me. They are outstanding among the apostles, and they were in Christ before I was. Greet Ampelitus, my dear friend in the Lord. Greet Urbanus, our co-worker in Christ, and my dear friend Statius. Greet Apollos, whose fidelity to Christ has stood the test. Greet those who belong to the household of Aristobulus. Greet Herodian, my fellow Jew. Greet those in the household of Narcissus who are in the Lord. Greet Tryphena and Tryphosa, those women who worked hard in the Lord. Greet my dear friend Persis, another woman who has worked very hard in the Lord. Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his mother, who has been a mother to me too. Greet Asyncritus, Philegion, Hermes, who makes bags, Patrobas, Hermes, and the other brothers and sisters with them. Greet Philogius, Julia, Nereus, and his sister, and Olympus, and all the Lord's people who are with them. Greet one another with a holy kiss. Let's pray. Father, as we read this passage, we are sometimes wondering what it is that you want to say to us. But we believe that your word was written and given to us that we might read it and that we might come to understanding of what your word means. I believe, Father, that you have a message. I believe you have a message that's absolutely for all of us, but I also believe that there's something special that you want to do in the hearts of, of the women of IES, the ladies of IES today. And so, Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit would bring this to pass as we look into your word together. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please take your seats again. Now, I've been working with this in a number of other passages for the last weeks as I've been preparing to do this, and it was pretty funny. Uh, last week, I was in Jogja, and I was meeting with some people who were involved in campus ministry and doing some training with them and so on and so forth, and so I made them do soap on uh, Romans chapter 16, verses 1 through 16. And uh, we're not going to do soap together today, but it was pretty funny because uh, I, I asked each of them, you know, anything that you happen to notice? And one of the guys, always one of the guys said, yeah, what's a holy kiss? Now, were any of you kind of wondering about that? You know, I, I'll tell you the cultural context for IES of greeting one another with a holy kiss. Handshake equals holy kiss. Okay, there we go. Uh, anyway, so what we're going to do is we're going to look at this and we're going to try and understand what does this passage of Scripture have to say to you and I today about the mission of the church, about proclaiming the gospel, about the good news. What is this all about? Well, what we're going to try and determine today is that we know the mission of the church. The mission of the church is to proclaim everywhere that Jesus Christ is the Lord. We know that the mission of the church is to tell everyone that on the cross, Jesus died so that the curse would be broken and we could become reunited with God the Father who had created us because we loved him, and we would be preparing for the day that we'll be with him in eternity. We know the cur the, the, we know that the mission of the church is that we would not only hear the good news, receive the good news, enact the good news, but we would proclaim the good news. Now the question we're going to examine today is, who does the mission of the church. 
if the mission of the church centers around the fact that Jesus Christ died on the cross and was raised from the dead, then certainly the message of the, the mission of the church involves proclaiming the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We just finished Easter. Easter is that fabulous time in the, in the year when we say that Jesus died for our sins, that God raised him from the dead, and then we'll, in a few days we'll, we'll celebrate Ascension Day together, not this coming week, but the week after that. And we will remember that God raised him back up and he left the Holy Spirit with us to empower us. But who were the first persons to proclaim this? Who were the, who were the head starters of this whole project? Do you know? Who were the first ones to proclaim that Jesus Christ had been raised from the dead? Who was it? You, you, you should know their names. Do you know their names? Mary, Mary, and Salome. All right, that's what it says in, in Mark chapter 16, verses 1 through 3. It says, when the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought, uh, bought spices so that they could go and anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb, and they asked each other, and they said, who will roll away the stone from the entrance of the tomb? Now we know as the story unfolds, they go there and Jesus has been raised from the dead and they're the first ones to proclaim to anyone. And then very soon other people get involved and as you read the, the list of all these occurrences where Jesus appears, he appears to Peter, he appears to two people on the road to Emmaus, he appears to Thomas, he appears to the disciples, eventually he appears to them on the Sea of Galilee and he appears, the Bible says, to his brother James and eventually a large group of them at one time. But the very first people who had the privilege of saying, Jesus is risen, were three women. Interesting, yeah? Why did that happen? There are some people who would say, oh, because God wanted to send an important message that women could be witnesses. And, and we know about all of that, that women weren't allowed to be legal witnesses. And there were other people who say, oh, don't, 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 don't try and make a major point of theology out of that. They were just the first because they were the first ones there because they were doing their job. Well, actually, if God chose them because they were the ones who were doing the job they were supposed to do, that sounds pretty good too. Because they were the ones that were doing what was necessary. In my experience, it is often that God uses people who are not sitting back and waiting to be told what to do, but they were doing what was necessary. In fact, it's funny, as I was just reading this over with you, I almost said, uh, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome brought spices, and I realize it's not brought spices, it's bought spices. So they even invested their own money in buying the spices to anoint the body of Jesus. In my life, I have often seen that it is women who go to places and do the work of the kingdom first because they are willing to be accomplished, to be involved, to do the things that are difficult, and the way to get things done. Now let me just explain to you as we're talking about these things because we're going to talk about women and men. There are two basic perspectives in the church world about women in the church. They are summed up by, in the terms egalitarian, and I am egalitarian. I believe that the gifts and callings and ministries of the Holy Spirit are given to both men and women equally, and that God uses men and women equally. He's no preference over one over the other, and anything in the kingdom of God that a man can do, a woman can do, and vice versa. I believe women can pastor churches and preach, and I believe that men can teach children and care for those who are sick. I believe that God gifts all of us equally, regardless of gender. Now, there are other people who disagree with that. They're called complementarians, and they mean it graciously. They have an understanding of Scripture, which, by the way, is a wrong understanding of Scripture. Let me make sure that you know where I stand on this. But they believe that there are certain roles that are reserved for only men, so that women can do all kinds of things, but men have to be the elders and the pastors and the main teachers in the church. I'm egalitarian. And I'm not egalitarian just because of my theology. I'm egalitarian because of my experience. I grew up in the Philippines. And the Philippines, when I grew up, the focus of our lives as our family was to plant churches. We planted churches. We were involved in church planting everywhere we were. My, my, my family, I lived with my parents on the island of Negros in the city of Bacolod. And during the four years that we lived there, we planted churches on every town up and down the road from that. And what I learned as I was growing up that I would meet pastors and I would meet church planners and some of them were men and some of them were women and some of them were couples and when these heroes would come to our city they would stay in my home and as a child Mr. So-and-so or Mr. and Mrs. So-and-so or Mrs. So-and-so or Miss So-and-so they were my heroes because they were all church planners. So it never occurred to me that, that God didn't use people equally. As I got a little older one time I was talking to somebody who was involved in church planting. 
And they said something really interesting to me. They said to me this. They said, we, see, we send women in to the most difficult places to plant a church because they will stay when it's hard. You see, if you, if you have a place you want to plant a church and you send a man, if he doesn't get any results after one or two years, surprisingly, God calls him somewhere else. I was telling the story with somebody the other day. It's a place in... Uh, it's a place in this country, and it looks like it would be a really easy place to plant a church, but it's really hard. I've been here 27 years. I've watched as churches have been planted. I've watched people go there and say, God called me to plant a church in such and such a place. And then I've watched after about a year or two when they didn't get any result, next thing I'd hear from them, they'd say, God called me to go someplace else now. Because they didn't, you know, something about our male ego, we, we want to see results. Sorry if I'm stepping on any toes. They would be male toes, I think, at this point, so... Be patient with me, folks. But the women will stick. They'll stick year after year after year after year. And then, interestingly enough, according to this church planter, once we begin to see results, and, and using an agricultural metaphor, once the ground is soft and there begins to be a harvest, we can send men in because now there's a result, and the women can move on to the difficult places where it's very, very, very hard to plant a church. We can only send men in when something is done that's successful. Women were the first ones to proclaim the resurrection of Jesus. So this brings us to this question, having read through this thing in Romans chapter 16, what do we see about who does the work of the kingdom? Paul is referring to his brothers and sisters in Christ, his fellow workers, his fellow laborers in the church at Rome. He is speaking of them, and he has a number of things to say to them, so let's take a look at this and let's understand If the mission of the church, if the work of the church is to proclaim the gospel, who's going to do that work? First of all, it's interesting to note that there are 24 different names of different Christians in Rome that are given, plus one other person whose name we don't hear. That's the mother of Rufus. But it's appropriate that Rufus's mother acted like a mother to Paul because it's Mother's Day. And so that's good too. And of these 24 Christians who are named, we know almost nothing about most of them. We really don't know anything about them. Now, some of you are thinking, I'm going to catch Pastor Dave. He made something wrong, and you're counting the names, and you mention, ah, oh, there's 26 names. Okay, doesn't count. Aristobulus and Narcissus are not Christians, at least as far as we know. There's no reason for us to believe they're Christians. Rather, Aristobulus and Narcissus are important people who have large homes, palaces perhaps, And in their palaces, there are a number of slaves and a number of other people, and they are the heads of these houses in Rome where Christians live. Uh, Aristobulus was actually the brother of King Herod Agrippa I. And so he has a palace there. He's royalty. He's he's Jewish royalty. And in his household, uh, there are Christians and who are following. And so Paul mentions the people who are in the house of Aristobulus. Everybody would know Aristobulus' house. Narcissus, interestingly enough, is an inter- a person that we know a fair amount about. Narcissus was a man who had been a slave. He became a freedman, and Narcissus was like the right-hand man for the emperor Claudius. And when the emperor Claudius died in 54 AD, Narcissus committed suicide. Now, the politics in Rome was serious business. And if you were at the right hand of, a, of an emperor, you were very, very important. But when the emperor died, you were in serious trouble with the next emperor. And so Narcissus actually killed himself. We know historically this, this is what happened. His household was established, and there were people in his household. We don't know who. Was it just slaves? Was it relatives? Was it family members? Was it people who worked there? Was it guards? They also were a church that was established in that household. In a, several cases, there are people concerned that are mentioned elsewhere in the New Testament. Priscilla and Aquila are mentioned uh, in Acts chapter 18, and we know a lot of things about them. Rufus, perhaps, is the one that's mentioned in the Gospel of Mark. Paul mentions five churches in Rome. He talks about the church that meets with Priscilla and Aquila. He talks about the household of Aristobulus and Narcissus. He talks about the people who are with Asyncritus and others in verse 14, and the people who are with Philugius and others in verse 15. So five churches in Rome, he's writing to all of them. Now think about this for a moment. Rome was the first city in history to have more than a million people. And so what that means is, is that in this huge city of Rome, under this vast Roman Pax Romana that spread out all over the world, there were five house churches of Christians. 
given the limitation of, ag uh, of architecture, probably none of them, maybe only vaguely Narcissus and Aristobuluses, would have been able to have more than 50, 60 people gathered together. Which means Paul is writing to the Christians, and if we assume 50 people for a household and five households, that means maximum there were maybe 250 Christians in the city. You understand that the church at this point is, is not a lot of people. Huge impact, huge impact, because they're historically they're referred to in, in, in Roman history. You know that and you understand that, but not that many of them. And so this is what we see. Who are these people? Who are these co-workers? Who's with Paul in the mission? Let's take a look at them. First of all, we find Phoebe. Phoebe. Who is Phoebe? The Bible tells us that she's from this one town that I'm pretending I know how to pronounce. And that town is a port city. It's a trading place. It's the port for the city of Corinth. And she's apparently coming to Rome with this letter that we're reading. Paul has written it out and he's given it to her. And she's going to go to the Christians and she's going to use this letter to introduce herself. And she may be the one or others will be the ones who will read this letter of instructions and introduction to all the Romans. We do not know a lot about her. In fact, we know very little about her, but we do know a few things. Paul describes her very eloquently. First of all, he calls, us his, calls her her sister, his sister. So there's that relationship of closeness. And then he says she is a deacon of the church. Now, depending on what translation you have, it may say deacon, it may say servant. The complicated thing here is it's the same word. It's the same Greek word. And we don't know at what point the, the name servant or the description servant became a title deacon. Somewhere along the line, the church said, well, these people who are serving the church should be given a title, and they started calling them by the title deacon. I, I'm not, I'm not, I can't say to you with assurance that that had already happened at this point. So we don't know if she was, you know, like on her name card it said Phoebe, deacon of the church, or when people said, man, Phoebe, she really serves the church so well. We don't know. We just know that she was significant to the church. Secondly, she's referred to as their benefactor. Now, that is a pretty specific title. The title of benefactor is actually the title of patron. And throughout the Greek and Roman world, patrons were the people who had the assets and the abilities to provide for people. So Phoebe has a church. She's founded a church. They probably meet in her home. She provides for them. She provides the food. When the guests come to share the word of God, they stay at her house. She has achieved a level in society where she is comfortable to lead a church. Now, probably not the only leader, but definitely a leader. It doesn't mean that she's preaching, but it doesn't mean that she isn't preaching. But it means that she's also materially providing for them. She is a sister to the Apostle Paul. This is a significant and a good thing. By the way, it's also, Bible scholars su suggest that Phoebe is either a divorced woman or a widow, because otherwise we would find out about her, uh, she would be under the, the, what shall I say, dominance or control of a man. But she seems to be able to run her own business and to go wherever she wants. Phoebe. Next we meet Prisca or Priscilla and Aquila. Now, these people we know something about because we've learned some things about them. Historically, in 49 AD, Claudius got so tired of the Jews in Rome that he expelled them all. And all the Jews who lived in Rome, who had been in Rome for hundreds of years, all of them had to leave. And until Claudius died in 54 AD, then they were allowed to go back. And during that period of time, we know that Priscilla and Aquila went to the city of Corinth. And they had the same business as the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul was a leather worker. He, he made tents, and the tents were made out of leather. They used, you know, strong needles and all of those things. And Priscilla and Aquila had the same profession. And so in Corinth, they were partners, and they worked together, and they spread the gospel because they were not only the same manual labor as Paul, they were the same spiritual labor as Paul. Later on, they were sent to Ephesus, and they planted the church in Ephesus. And in Ephesus, they trained a very famous television evangelist. Pastor Dave, are you sure he was a television evangelist? Well, it's Apollos. And what we know about Apollos is that he was very eloquent. People like to look at him and listen to him, but he didn't really understand the gospel completely. Sounds like a television evangelist to me, you know, something like that. And, and what happened with him, because he's so eloquent and he doesn't really know what he's saying, he was sent to spend some time with Priscilla and Aquila to live with them, and they instructed him. They straightened out his doctrine. They, they helped him get things correct. 
They're teachers in the church. They're pillars in the church. Imagine that, that there's a great preacher that everybody wants to hear, but his doctrine's a little bit funny. So they put them under the wings of Priscilla and Aquila so that they can straighten him out. And I, I have to say, lest we make fun of Apollos before we meet him in heaven, good for him for doing it. Because he could have said, I'm Apollos. Everybody wants to hear me preach. Why should I change my doctrine? But he was willing to learn the truth. Now, Paul joined them later in Ephesus, and then they moved back home. Now, one of the things we know about them is they had a church in their home. Now, understand this. We, we know this from building excavations in Rome and all this stuff, that most of the tradespeople, which is what they were, they would live in what you and I would call a ruco, a, a two-story house that would be built with the, with the workroom and the selling place downstairs, and upstairs there would be a place for everybody to live. So, uh, uh, Priscilla and Aquila had a ruco in which downstairs they made tents and upstairs they lived and the church gathered there. So one of the earliest churches in Rome met in a ruco. Sounds like Jakarta. You know, it's just the, the kind of thing that we see going around here. Uh, let's move on. What else do we see or what else do we encounter here? All right. So we meet Andronicus and Junia. Now this is amazing because Andronicus and Junia are almost certainly husband and wife. And if you, if you have some translation of the Bible, it's kind of funny because it may say Andronicus and Junius. There is no such name as Junius, but it's a male version. And some people don't like to admit that Junia was a woman because of the things that it says about them. But what does Paul say about Andronicus and Junia? Uh, by the way, for those of you who are keeping score, uh, no church fathers before the 13th century thought that Junia was Junius. They all accepted that it was a husband and wife that's being talked about here. It's only modern day people who got confused. What do we know about them? It says, Paul says, they were imprisoned with him. Now we don't know if that means they were actually in prison, uh, the same prison together, but what we really believe it means that they were in prison at the same time. They were in prison sort of in the same time when Christians were being thrown in jail. Let me try and explain that to you. A lot of times, uh, not so much nowadays because there are more famous people, but one of the most famous persons to come from, from Seattle, from my home area, is a guy named Bill Gates. You've probably heard of Bill Gates. And, uh, and uh, when people would ask me, oh, oh, you came from Bellevue. Did, did you know Bill Gates? And I would always tell them, yes, he and I went to different high schools at the same time. I never met him. I don't know him. You know, he doesn't know me. I know who he is. But what we think here is what Paul is saying, yeah, Andronicus and Junia, they're wonderful people. We went to different prisons at the same time. You know, we were both in prison for the faith. Paul goes on to say that they are apostles. Now, that's why some people don't like to admit that it's a woman, because they're bothered with a woman having the title apostle. Now, let's not worry about this too much. Let's understand what Paul uses the term apostle, and he uses it quite, quite liberally. To him, an apostle is anyone that's sent by God on a mission. Actually, that's technically what the name means. When an emperor would send his representative to another country, he would send an apostle, a messenger. And in the church, anyone who is a commissioned messenger is an apostle. And Paul says, Andronicus and Junia are apostles. And then he says, they were in the Lord before me. In fact, a lot of people believe that they're called apostles because one of the qualifications for an apostle was that they had to have seen the resurrected Lord. And a lot of people believe that Andronicus and Junia were in that crowd. And that's what Paul means. They were following Jesus. They saw the resurrected Lord. And, and they were following him before even I was. We go on to find out about the household of Aristobulus. I mentioned Aristobulus is the guy who owns the palace. He's, he's the brother of Agrippa. He died 48, 49 A.D. But his household, they're all there, and there's a bunch of believers there. Again, the household of Narcissus, the same thing. He was a freedman, but he had been insignificant, and he had this household, this nice, beautiful place where there were gatherers, people who gathered together. He goes on to mention Tryphena and Tryphosa. How many of you like puns? Do you, do you like puns? Yes. Yeah, all right. Well, Tryphena and Tryphosa, those two names, uh, the names are names that emphasize how delicate they are. It's like a little girl names that parents would give these sweet little girls, and it means how delicate they are. And Paul says, Tryphena and Tryphosa, they worked so hard. So that's a pun on Tryphena and Tryphosa, get it? They're delicate and soft, but they really work hard. Not a very good pun, yeah. The Apostle Paul was not really that good at puns. Uh, he does a few good ones, but he can't resist the bad ones too. And I can't resist telling you even though you don't care. 
And then there's Persis, who's another woman who works hard in the Lord. And then there's two other groupings of these two churches in group verse 14 and 15. So Paul talks about five churches. All right. How is the mission of the church accomplished? How is the mission of the church accomplished? All of you should have had one of these cards near your seat. I want you to get the card if it's near your seat. Get the card because we're going to work our way through this to understand how the mission of the church works. How is the mission of the church worked? What did we learn from this particular passage? What did we learn from our study today? Now, in this, we're challenging everybody in the church to participate, and and you've been told about it. We want you to commit to be involved in certain ways. We want you to tear that front one off and and keep it in your pocket and keep it in your Bible, keep it with your phone, keep it on your refrigerator somewhere so that you know that you've made a commitment. But we're asking you to think about three things, about praying, about giving, and about joining. I I want to mention these three things. First of all, How is the mission of the church accomplished? Number one, you need to know that the mission of the church is always a spiritual effort. First and foremost, before anything else, the mission of the church is always a spiritual effort. Prayer must be involved in every stage of the mission of the church. It must be the foundation of everything that we do. Right there in the very beginning in the book of Acts, we read about the church at Antioch, and it says that they were there, they were together, and while they were praying and fasting and seeking God, God spoke to them and said, send Paul and send Barnabas out. And the very first people that we would refer to as missionaries, as sent apostles, were sent out of a time of prayer. This fits in with what Jesus told us in Matthew chapter 9, verses 37 and 38, when he speaks to his disciples and he said, the harvest is great, but the workers are few. Pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest. Ask him to send more workers into his fields. The first thing that you and I need to do is we need to pray because fulfilling the mission of God is, first of all, a spiritual thing. One of the things we're asking you to commit to is the prayer walk. Uh, Is there anybody here who happens to believe that Jakarta needs prayer right now? Anybody kind of comfortable with that idea that, that, that this is the time when this city really needs prayer? In the providence of the Lord and in the Lord's good grace, we have a planned prayer walk for next Sunday. And if you're willing to come to church a little bit early and you're willing to be trained in how you need to prayer walk, now some of you have not prayer walked before, you don't understand the principle. The principle of prayer walking is to go by yourself or with a small group of people to certain places and pray for certain things. I think it's an entirely appropriate time for the church to be praying. And I want to challenge you all to sign up to be a part of the prayer walk. Now, I'm not going to give you all the details. All I know is that next week you need to come here. What time are they gathering? Six, seven? Yeah, sometime between six and eight, you show up here. You show up on the eighth floor. You'll be assigned with somebody who will be your guide, and you will go on a walk that will take about an hour or so. If you're really enthusiastic, you can run and take 45 minutes. If you're not so enthusiastic, you can walk slow, and they will take you to different places, and in those places, you'll pray together because this is first and foremost a spiritual thing. Look, folks, let's be honest. Do we want God to change this city? Is it going to happen because we want it? What are we supposed to do? This is ultimately a spiritual thing. We must be willing to pray. And we want you to sign up to be a part of the prayer walk, and we want you to be signed up to be a part of praying even in this coming year. If the only prayer that you could measure is, God, let there be more people who want to tell others about Jesus, then you're praying what Jesus told you to pray. Number one, it's always a spiritual effort. Number two, it's always a costly effort. It's always a costly effort. It costs something to share the message of the gospel. In Romans chapter 10, the clearest thing that Paul had said earlier before he read off all this list, he said, how can anyone call on the name of the Lord if they haven't believed him? And how can they believe in the person they've never heard of? And how can they hear without somebody telling them about Jesus? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? We challenge you to be involved financially in the mission of, of, of this church. Now, we, we separate, as I mentioned to we separate our ministry fund, which does all the ministry of IES, and our mission, which goes outside of us to reach those people who are beyond the barriers that we want to reach. I'll, I'll just be honest with you. Uh, I mentioned to you, on the exit, you can give an exit offering. All that goes into the missions. But we really appreciate those who have made 
monthly commitments. They let us know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to contribute a million a month. I'm going to contribute five million a month because it allows us to budget as we understand what our cash flow is. Right now, we as a church have two tremendous opportunities to support people in ministry that need financial help, need us to invest with them so that they can do some really important ministries. And we need to be able to get a hold of the finances so that we can do it because we don't want to tell somebody, we're going to help you, and then in the end we'll say, well, we wanted to help you, but we couldn't. I'll give you an example. One of the opportunities that we have, somebody from Indonesia has had an opportunity to go to another country. And in a mega city in that country, they have an opportunity to reach out to Indonesians who are there who are students. And because they're Indonesians together in a foreign land, they're able to share the gospel, and they're reaping a harvest of Indonesian students in that, in that mega city. And not only that, in that city, not only are they reaching many Indonesian students, but they're making contacts with other people who are believers, and they're actually being invited to preach in the other churches in that area. Now, it's complicated. I'm not going to tell you what country it is, but I'll give you a hint. When they preach, it has to be translated into Mandarin. Did I say too much? But they need our help to stay there. They have, to, they have to be able to put their child in school. They have to be able to rent a house. You get it, don't you? You have to rent a house for yourself. You have to put your kids in school. They need to do that as well. We're preparing to understand, along with all of the other brother and sister churches that we have, how much we can be able to help them. But we can't do any of those things unless the cost comes unless we all make a decision together that we're going to give. And then, mostly important here, number three, it's always a team effort. It's always a team effort. If there's anything we notice about that, that we notice that what Paul is talking about is being accomplished by somebody he calls his sister and somebody he calls his brother, somebody who calls a friend in the Lord, he's, you know, you would think if there's anybody who could be like a superstar, it's the Apostle Paul. I mean, we, we hardly even say his name without the title, the Apostle, in front of it. And yet, as mightily as the Lord used him, he calls all of these different people, 24 people that we see their names of. Most of them, we don't know anything about them, except they were workers with Paul. It was always a team effort. That's our emphasis for this session, folks. This is about all of us being enrolled and engaged and and pushing forward in the mission of the church. That's what we're talking about. In, in, in Romans uh, 16, we saw that these people were all in the church working together. They, They lived in different homes. They were different classes of people. Those people who understand the names and the history and culture of Rome will tell you that some of these names are people who are slaves, and some of these names are people who once were slaves, and now they're free, and some of them are very aristocratic names. And somehow in the church, the church had slaves and the people who owned slaves in the same church because the message of the gospel had set people free. Different homes, different classes of people, different backgrounds of people, different classes of homes palaces and rukos. And then the thing that we saw that drew me to this passage was that we see that women are involved in the mission of the church. Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, Salome, Phoebe, Prisca, Junia, Tryphena, Tryphosa, Persis, they are all completely engaged in the mission of the church. Now, I had a problem when I came up to this particular point because I'm trying to wrap all this up in some kind of a thing that you'll understand, and there's a great temptation for me to say this. Women have a role in the mission of the church, and I'm not going to say that because to me, that's, that's not true, and it's kind of insulting to women. But the implication is that the mission of the church is about men and women get to be involved if they want. And that's not true. Now, if you want to have a little reflection of that, you understand one of the things that we talk about in IES. I was with something the other day with some people from IES, and and somebody said, yeah, children of the future of the church. And we all looked at each other like, no, children of the church right now. Women are not playing a role in the church. Women are the church. You understand that? Women are the instrument of the gospel. Now, I'm not meaning that in an exclusionary sense. Men are the gospel 
carriers. Children are the gospel carriers. Adults are the gospel carriers. Teenagers are the gospel carriers. Senior citizens are the gospel carriers. We are all called to be in God's mission. No one is more important. No one is less important. No one is joining alongside the superstars or the super gender or anything else. And what I'm going to do today is I'm going to do what we do every lady's day. I'm going to pray for every lady here. But in addition to praying for every lady here, I'm going to do something else. I believe with all my heart that God wants to use every woman here in the message and the mission of the church. And I am going to pray and I'm going to commission all of you in the kingdom of God. I am sorry that there are some people in the church who would suggest that women deserve a secondary role. And that is a great sin in the church. But it's not true. The Lord who called me called you. The Lord who called us called us all. And my desire is that every woman here would know that God has called her to have play a role in the mission of the church and to, that no roles are outside of her ability as the Holy Spirit gifts her to be involved and to do.